his skill set, what stood out to you guys to make him great? Uh, well, we love the uh, on ice athleticism and big save ability, um, especially at his size. He's obviously a big kid. We feel like he's just scratching the surface. Um, you know, he's had a lot of international experience. Um, you could say some of it's been up and down. Uh, but what's really impressed us is it, it seems like every time he's faced some adversity, and we saw it at the um, under-18s this year, he's had a big bounce-back game. Um, you know, we had a couple really good live viewings of him, you know, playing with the men. Um, and, you know, a good interview with him in Buffalo. Uh, we think he's an athletic kid um, and, and just a lot of upside and a smart goalie. Um, and, and, and Seamus, you know, Kotak, our development uh, coach, has some history working with the Finnish goalies. He's done a good job building relationships with all our goalies. And, uh, you know, the idea of having this guy in our hands on him for the next few years is really exciting for us. And, and I will add, there was a, a major gap on our list to the next goalie. Would that, would that really be why you're told that 40 men would probably hire most people by really good? We, we've been talking about this, as you can imagine, for a long time, and, and what's the right spot to take a goalie. And I think everyone's talked about and knows it, it wasn't viewed as a high-end draft for goalies in terms of you know, the, the, the volume of goalies that you'd want to use a first or second round pick on. Um, but, you know, we felt this guy, you know, had first, second round value. And the question was, do we use one of our first round picks or take a chance and, and wait for the second round pick? Um, and, you know, it, it really, it, there never was a consideration that we would have gone later than that. What did you learn about him? Well, he, he was in, he was his English is pretty good. I wouldn't say it's perfect at this point, but it's pretty good. And we had a little bit of banter back and forth. He's a very confident kid. He's got some personality to him. That that's consistent with a lot of our due diligence we had from his club team, uh, from his his goalie coaches over the years, from the international team. You know, he's a popular kid in in his peer group. Um, so it was just, um, it, it was, there were very positive feelings. Um, there was some jokes made that, you know, maybe he wasn't going to be happy being drafted by Buffalo because I kept him in the room a little bit long. Uh, and he might have had it with us by the end. But, um, no, it was, it was a good relationship. And as I said, you know, Seamus has great relationships. You'd be surprised with a lot of the goalie coaches, a well-thought-of goalie coaches over in Finland, including his. So uh, we had a lot of information on this kid, and again, a, a, a player that we think is just scratching the surface. So Nuchev, you know, and we've talked a lot about this with the Russians um, this year. If we thought there was a, a high-value pick that started to drop, um, you know, and we liked, and, and Ruslan and Frank Muso liked the story of the kid um, and the, the potential and, and maybe the desire for the kid to be over here at some point. And we're not going to rush any of these kids. Um, you know, Nuchev was, in our mind, one of the top three players out of Russia this year. Um, so a lot of us had... Uh, first, late first, early second round grade on him. Um, he, if you just look at his, I mean, our analytics staff was extremely high on him. They definitely had a first round grade on him. But if you just look at his raw production on his MHL team this year, he scored 40 goals on that team. And I don't think anyone else had more than 16 goals on his same team. He had 67 points, I want to say, and the next closest guy had 40 points on the same team. So as much as he's a scorer, which he clearly is, he was also driving play by himself. Um, a very competitive kid, a great stick. Um, he's got great edges. He's got to take another step with his open ice speed. 
Um, but we, we really like the combination of playmaking, the ability to drive play by himself, and then you know having the scoring, the high-end scoring element to his game. He, he plays in an organization where um, Datsuk is going to be the head of development in that organization next year and has already had his hands on some of these players. Um, so that's, you know, that's very appealing to us that he's in a very good development spot right now. What can you tell us about Jake Richard? Uh, don't see a lot of kids come out of our order. No, and, and, and a very late birthday for this draft. Very raw, basically playing, you know, midget hockey up into the, this season. And another kid, if you went back and looked at his raw numbers and the teams he's played on up to this year, it's absurd, you know, what he's done in relation to other players on his team. And he really surprised the Muskegon staff this year um, and, and kind of forced his way into a top, certainly a top six, but even a top line role with two really good experienced USHL players, had a very good playoff. His second half um, primary production in terms of primary assists, but also from an analytics perspective, just primary playmaking in the second half was in the top one or two percentile even strength in that league. So to do that as a young draft eligible, um, you know, I'm, I'm very close with the UConn staff. They are very excited about him. I think there was even, you know, an indication that they'd be willing to bring him in this year, but they don't really want to do that because he's in a good development spot in Muskegon. We'll, we'll talk about that more after development camp. Um, I, I love the idea of him going back and dominating the USHL even more next year. Uh, but, but that's how highly they think of him. They think he could be playing in a, in a top nine role in Hockey East next year, which is really mind-boggling to think of where the kid came from just a year ago. It, it does. I mean, the bloodlines, you just see how many players get their names called every year who fathers played. I mean, the, the information that's at their fingertips on a daily basis with their fathers, forget the, the physical component where you're, you're betting on the genetic factor. Um, just learning to be a pro, and, and this is what a lot about what this kid is about. He had a very good playoff. He plays a huge role on their team. Um, you know, obviously the size just under 5'11 is not ideal. Um, you know, you'd probably prefer in a perfect world he was a right shot, not a left shot, but he's an excellent puck mover, and he's skilled enough that he can play his offside. The father played at six feet. We have some people in our organization and on our staff that know the father very well. Um, so the hope would be he gets to six feet. He, you know, he's certainly strong on his feet. And, you know, the sense and the puck skills are going to get him out of a lot of trouble that, you know, a six foot two guy might get himself into. Jerry, when Bob Rowe was here, he made it pretty clear he was big on players in Sweden. Kevin just said to us, you know, we love Sweden. I mean, how much has Kevin took over? Was, was he kind of sold on the benefits of getting Swedish players? Well, I think it, it helps that. From a person perspective, we're so high on all the players we have in our organization that are from Sweden. I, I think it helps that we've clearly gotten some high-value picks out of Sweden in the past, you know, with Allmark and Olofsson. Um, you know, I've said this before, Anders Forsberg has been in the game of hockey and in the NHL for a long time. Uh, we all lean on him. Um, Jason Nightingale's got great experience from a development model perspective and some work he's done over the years uh, with the Frölunda program and other programs in Sweden. I have a fair amount of experience myself going back to even my college days with, you know, 15 or 20 Swedish players. And then, you know, our, our other scouts in Europe help us there too. And Kevin Devine has, you know, 25 years of experience in Sweden, so it's it's an area we're very comfortable with, and you know we like the development path. and And I'll, I'll add that the three programs or organizations, Arebro, 
uh, for Lunda and Rogla, we think of the world of in terms of their development of players. Well, I will say I, I, every year, you know, the list seems to get more and more exact. Uh, like every single name in our top 130, you know, went off the board in the, you know, the, the top six rounds. I mean, there were years you could get through the whole draft with 80 or 90 or 100 names at most. So the whole league's getting better at identifying players, number one, and I've said how useful our analytics staff is for us early on and definitely at the mid-year point on making sure we're getting proper coverage of all players. So they do a great job of steering our amateur staff when we're not getting enough looks live or on video of players. So that's extremely helpful. And then, you know, when we have a disparity between, especially at the top of the draft, between what the analytic staff is seeing and, you know, what the amateur staff is seeing with their eyes, you know, we got to get to the bottom of that pretty quickly. And you certainly don't want to be calling a name in the top two or three rounds where there's a disconnect. Um, so, I, you know, Sam Ventura and his staff just came up to me and, you know, was talking about how thrilled they are with how the draft went from their perspective. I said the same to them. That doesn't mean we didn't have some disagreements on, on certain players that we took, but, you know, both sides understood what we were looking at if we went a little bit against each other at certain points in the draft. Yep. Uh, and I, I'm sure I didn't listen to Kevin's um, press conference, but I I'm, I'm, would assume he touched on this with all three players, um, it, more so with the first two. You know, I, I, I think I would probably expect people to initially say or talk about the lack of size with the top two players. And I don't think anyone would say that about Kulik, because even though he's a little bit under six foot, he, he's plays bigger than that. He's very strong on his feet. He never seems to be small in any part of his game. But all three players, we have zero issue with the size because each player has, in our mind, um, elite compete and, you know, close to elite skating. So I, I get scared off, and we talk about skating size ratio in our organization overall, but especially on our, in our amateur staff, those are the guys that scare me off first of all. So if you can get past the hurdle where you have a smaller player and they have um, you know, very good to exceptional skating, you know, you, you've ticked that off because I think that's almost always a necessity when you're drafting a small player at the top of the draft. And then if you can add to that um, the high compete dimension that Savoy and Oslin have, and Coolidge for that matter, um, it, 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 yeah, we want them to get a little bit bigger and stronger, but both of these guys are right now and will be in the NHL an absolute pain in the ass to play against. And, and you combine that with their skill and their hockey sense, the size doesn't become an issue to me anymore. Um, and then, you know, Coolidge, I don't know if, you know, Kevin mentioned this, and I won't get into details, but, um, and everyone's going to say this about one or two players that they drafted the last two days, but it, it was a little shocking to us where we were able to get him in the draft. So, you know, we were very excited about the other two players, but um, Coolidge, to get him where we got him, you know, what I will tell you is we got three players that we had very definitively in the top half of the first round on our board. All three players told us they, they're centers, but they can also play wing and we have also played. You know Don Granato, he talks about that a lot, having players that can do both. So did that matter when you were looking at those three guys too? For sure. And, and I think when you look at the international level and you look at these players playing in their men's league, 
So they're either playing at the top level. Some of these guys, you know, like in Kulik's case, at an under-20 level as an 18-year-old. And in, in Kulik, you know, and Oslin playing against men at, at, as 18-year-olds. And their coaches are playing them at center. That tells you a lot about the versatility of the player. It probably tells you a lot about their skating. It, it tells you something about their hockey sense and compete. Do we expect all three to be NHL centers? You know, probably not. I, you know, I, I will tell you, Oslin, you know, for sure has every single quality you would want in an NHL center other than size. And I just talked about the other attributes that I think will easily offset the size. and. You know, when he went up to the SHL this year in very limited minutes, I get that. They play him at center. You know, he he went to the under 18s. He played a couple games, 25 plus minutes at center at the under 18s on the gold medal team. And I don't know that we ever saw a drop off in his play. So, yeah, it's it's very encouraging when you see them playing at center and then the versatility going forward of always knowing they can move back there if they don't come into your organization that way, is comforting. Um, and, you know, I think the coaches all value that. Kevin, both mentioned compete with the first-round picks. Where do you look for that? Well, you know, I think sometimes, and we talk about this a lot in our organization, you know, don't get fooled by toughness and aggressiveness and compete. Like, all players compete in different ways. Um, you know, the, maybe the number one thing for me would be second effort and, and puck battles. And, you know, what, what does a guy do immediately after he's knocked off the puck or knocked off his ass? Um, the desire and ability to play on the inside of the game. Uh, quite honestly, I worry a little bit with all three of these players sometimes on their, um, you know, eagerness too much so sometimes to play on the inside of the game. Um, but, you know, th th those are the type of things. And, and showing no fear in their game. Like, I, I can't say I've ever seen one time in my viewings of each of these three players any fear in their game, even when they're playing against, you know, men. When you went through the scenarios before the draft, how often was the boy there for you at number nine? Uh, we were getting right on the border there. You know, and, and there were there were two players, you know, we were super excited about um, to, to get at number nine that we thought might be realistic, and he was one of the two. First time out on the floor, Kevin, uh, how was he on uh, You know what I love about Kevin is he's so level-headed, um, and... Uh, I'm sorry, guys. It's been a lot. It's gone on here. Oh, I'm good now. He includes everyone. He lets everyone do the jobs. And he's done an incredible job at bringing this entire organization together. And, I, you know, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, you know, we've obviously been through a lot, you know, minor for me, but the last month or so, but the whole organization's been through a lot since I've been here. And to see the coaches and the development staff and the Rochester staff and all our support staff and how everyone works together, um, you know, to me, that all starts with the Pergulas and Kevin. So I apologize for that. That's you know. So, um, but he was great. He was great on the floor, and he's always professional. And you know, he includes everyone. He's respectful, and he's got a lot on his plate managing everything. And he does it, you know, with dignity and professionalism.